everybody can see this. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to go through kind of my personal story on uh, where I started and, you know, obviously, like, what I wish I'd done and kind of the standard conversation that I have with people because um, I've, I've had, I think I'm going to say, I've probably said thousands of times to plenty of individuals, which is why I think it's good to have a group here um, so I can kind of share it at once and you can go to the breakout rooms and um, it, uh and some of the common questions I'm sure people are going to have. But so basically, this is what we'll go through. Um, I'll show you what the Robinhood portfolio I have looks like as of March. It hasn't really changed. Um, and then show you what I think is the best place to begin, uh, how I did it myself, um, what types of accounts, how to allocate funds, look at ETS mutual funds, um, how, how to research those, some case studies, and uh, we'll get more into some of the technical stuff like dollar cost averaging, and we'll have a couple of graphs, charts. Um, and if anybody wants to ask a question along the way, just interject. That's fine. Um, right, so this is what my portfolio looked like. This is about three weeks ago. It hasn't really changed much. Um, I just looked at it like 10 minutes ago, and it was $300 lower. Um, so this, this is not all the positions, but this can kind of give you an idea. Um, I really like Robinhood. I think it's very user friendly for uh, beginners or for retail investors who aren't very experienced and are kind of looking to get their feet wet. Um, and can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, if I'm not a American citizen, can I have a can I open a Robinhood account? Uh, I'm uncertain because I am an American citizen. Um, I would just get that a click Google. Uh, I know they, you know, they're kind of one of the new brokers on the block, so they might be restricted in which nations they can service. It might only be the states, um, so I'm just not certain. But, um, I'm sure I look on their website; uh, they'll be able to help you answer that question. Um, so I cannot get rich. I know you have to be American to get rich. That's actually in our constitution. That's why we invade so many other nations. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be focusing mostly like on, on like on these, like VTI, VXUS. CXSC is another ETF. These are all ETFs. Every other position in here is an individual firm. Uh, you know, Google, Walmart, McDonald's, uh, all these guys. Um, and so the first thing you need to do, obviously, is you need to pick an account. Like I picked Robinhood. Um, and there's going to be two general reasons that you're going to be investing. You're going to be doing it uh, because you're saving up for when you get into your 60s and you hit that retirement age, you get all the tax benefits. Um, Depending on where your income is at now, if it's kind of stagnated and you don't think it's really going to grow much more, you're going to go with a traditional IRA. Um, and you think that you're going to be able to maybe double, triple, quadruple, whatever your current annual income, then a Roth IRA is better. Uh, and that's just because Roth IRA, you're going to pay today's taxes. You're going to pay taxes on your wages, then put those wages into uh, your account. And then that means that you're basically minimizing the income tax you pay because if your income is going to go up in the future, then you want to avoid paying that higher income tax in the future. And then vice versa with the traditional IRA. Uh, as your income goes up, as your income taxes go up, um, you, uh, you're going to have to pay those taxes anyway. So why? So you want to avoid paying them today. You don't pay income taxes today. You put them straight into your account, start investing with them, and then you pay the income tax when you uh, take out the investments in the future, which means that you have more capital up front to, to grow. So you get the pro so instead of like a dollar being taxed away today, you can keep that dollar in your account and you get to keep all the profit from that dollar and then you just pay that dollar in taxes when you when you have selling that position. Um, and then there's kind of more what I do and I do do that. I do do retirement investing um, with like a Roth and you know, 401k. Um, then if you want to take out uh, an investment before you get your uh, senior citizen status, and if you take them out before you hit your senior citizen status, you're going to have to pay a penalty. Um, so if you want to take them out in your 30s, 40s, 50s, then a brokerage account is better um, because you just end up having to pay capital gains tax, short or long. Um, and Basically, long-term capital gains is always 10% for holding a position for longer than one year before you sell it. 
short-term gains is you pay whatever your current original income tax is. If you're making like, I think, I think it's like 35 to 85 roughly, you're gonna pay 22% on any short-term capital gains if you sell a position within one year of purchasing it. Um, but you don't have to pay a penalty. So this is just a good way to basically store uh, your cash for a while in some good investments and, and just have it growing on the side until there's something you need, maybe your house, maybe you want to do a startup, vacation, whatever. So Buffett just said this, he said that there's really no better investment than to pay off credit card debt that you're paying interest on. Um, so this is always kind of the way I think of prioritizing, like when I get income, where do I allocate it? I got credit card debt and I'm going to, have to pay interest on it, which thankfully I haven't ever had yet. I've always been able to pay off statement balances or to do balance transfers without any additional fees. Um, I'm going to kill that as quickly as possible because you know, you're going to pay whatever 20, 25% uh, monthly interest, which compounding annually is just absolutely insane. Um, then as when I have cash on hand, I, I mean, some people say three months, I really feel more comfortable at least with six months of cash of my cost of living. So if your cost of living is a thousand a month or 2000 a month, it'd be six, six K or 12 K in cash. Um, and I like to have a little more than that. You know, I, I keep, I usually keep a lot of cash in my brokerage account, but then also in like my personal bank account, just so if you know, there's like a COVID and the, and the market crashes, I got a lot of extra cash, one, to feel safe about covering my cost of living, but then also to jump into the market and start buying up everything that's on sale. Uh, and then the third thing, as far as like where I'm investing every single month, because sometimes I won't, I won't really do active investing for months, like half a year even for quarters. Um, but every single month, I'm going to be dollar cost averaging to these two ETFs, other ones I do. And I have a couple other positions I do this with. Um, but that's, uh, that'll be reviewed later as far as what dollar cost averaging is for um, and what the risk profile of these kinds of securities is. The reason that I'm doing ETFs, BTI and VXUS and not mutual funds um, is basically this story over here of what Warren Buffett uh, did back in uh, 2008. I think it was yeah, 2008 to 2016, I guess. Um, I think it ended like at the beginning of 2017. Uh, and basically he made a $1 million bet against um, a hedge fund uh, that was saying whoever outperforms the other at the end of nine years, um, we'll get to take all these for profit and give it to a charity of their choice. And he was just saying that what he did was he just bought um, an S and P 500 um, stock market ETF uh, and an ETF for those that might be unfamiliar is just essentially an index. Uh, there's all kinds you could you could have an etf on in the energy sector in the technology sector um in you know uh commodities whatever uh he just picked the s p 500 because the s p 500 is generally agreed upon as being a representation of the american stock market um one way to think about it is like if you put 500 dollars in the s p 500 etf which is a single security it's like one, you have one share in that etf it's kind of the same as putting one dollar into each of those 500 companies which theoretically is exposing you to the entire stock market. Um, Buffett was saying that it's like, it's not that these hedge funds or these mutual funds can't generate superior returns to the market. It's that they can't generate superior returns for their investors who they're working for because of the fees and the commissions that they're charging. Um, and you can just kind of see this graph. This is the index fund that Buffett had. Uh, and over nine years, it went up 85.4. The average hedge fund went 22.0. Um, and protege who he was competing against in this, um, I think, yeah, they got a cumulative return of 2.2% a year, or, uh, yeah, they got annualized return of 2.2 versus Buffett got a 7.1 annual which compounding over nine years is a dramatic difference. Um, so that really persuaded me, um, just that reasoning, that story as to why ETS are better than mutual funds for that consistent monthly investing. So next question to ask is what is your risk profile like? What's your risk tolerance? Uh, generally, I, I would say this is just kind of a, a pretty simple way of uh, viewing different asset classes. Um, cash is very fungible. You know, you can exchange it for a lot of other like, goods and services very easily, very quickly. Um, and it doesn't really grow naturally. I mean, if, if you put in a checking account, you're getting like maybe like I think you get like seven cents, every thousand dollars or something like it's insane. Uh, you don't you don't really get any 
return on it because it's so fungible. Um, so cash is not really going to change much unless the government starts printing a bunch of money and inflating everything, uh, which is why, which is part of why I think we saw a lot of people uh, throwing money into the stock market in the last few months and seeing a lot of uh, increases in uh, different commodities. You know, you know, Bitcoin. People are kind of treating it like a store of value, like like gold or silver, um, which is a weird thing millennials are doing uh, because they're so afraid of their cash uh, just getting depreciated from the massive amount of monetary uh, supply increase that we've seen from the, the feds. Uh, government bonds, I'd say they're pretty much worthless right now. The interest rates are ridiculously low. I think back in like the, the 80s or something, you could get maybe like 7 or even 10% uh, return on them. And now it's like less than 2%. Uh, China's actually up in us here. I think they're up at like 5% right now on their government bonds, um, which is interesting. And then you have mutual funds and ETFs. Like I said, they're kind of in the same class. Um, but like I said, because of uh, Buffett debt, I really think ETFs are a lot more interesting. Um, obviously, if you find if you have the right manager, you have the right team, a mutual fund could outperform. Um, so it's not really like the end all be all, but just in, just in general, um, ETFs. Like I said, because they're doing that indexing, you're not exposed to just a single firm. Um, that helps mitigate your risk, kind of keeps you moderate. And the, we'll, we'll look at this a bit later, but the, the stock market for about the last 90, 90 to 100 years, it's returned about 8 to 12% annually. Um, and so an ETF was a good way of getting exposed to that consistent annual return over long periods of time. Because over short periods of time, you know, we could have a bear market and it's crashing. We could have a bull market and it's going up way too fast. Um, over long periods of time, an ETF is a great way to get that annual 8 to 12% return. And you got established stocks, large, mid, small. Small, I, I think technically, might be a hundred million. It's if it's like a hundred million to like, uh, like a billion in, in market cap. I think that's small. Um, it might be a little different than that. Uh, and mid cap, I think it's like one to five billion. Large cap, just anything above like five billion. Uh, and and those are so risky, but because they are established and they've they've got some capital they've got some history you know they've got some uh, financial statements you can go back and you can look at and examine uh that mitigates that risk a bit because you're more familiar with their operations and everything and then you have speculative stuff cryptocurrencies new on the block a lot of people don't understand it um extremely volatile because of that lack of knowledge that the average person has a micro cap very small they don't have history recent ipo doesn't have history there's no financial statements to go back and look at penny stocks um we'll talk about that a bit in the breakout later um, and basically they're just, uh, as to do with the stock price, uh, is, is the issue. So when you're trying to figure out where on this bar you should kind of focus on, for me, I like to be right in here, right about this 70, 75% of the way up, maybe a little bit to 80. Uh, that's just my personal risk tolerance. I can handle a lot of risk, but then the big thing is, are you losing sleep? Are you sitting in bed at night on your phone, looking at your, uh, account of, worrying about how all the bars and graphs are changing, looking at like the last day, the last week, the last month. Um, if that's if that's keeping you from sleeping, then you're definitely exposed to too much risk. I also just be a bit of a novice and, and it gets really exciting looking at this stuff all the time uh, and a little time will go by and get a little more uh, sure with it. Um, big thing with the high risk stuff, this is big with the cryptocurrencies. I went through this. You also see it with like the Wall Street bet stuff. Is FOMO, the fear of missing out, where you have something super volatile. As people are seeing over the course of days, weeks, it's doubling, tripling, quadrupling, whatever, and it's crashing back down. And they see that happen a couple times and they think, oh, if I just bought in, and I've been so much better off. But you know, that's hindsight's 2020. Um, and it's very easy to kind of start to get the uh, the gambler's fallacy um, and start putting money just where you shouldn't. On again, something that's very speculative. Um, if you're somebody that's really speculative about that kind of stuff and and have that emotional reaction very quickly to seeing um, success that some people are having, like on YouTube, that they're talking about, the issue is that when you see those really popular videos or whatever, somebody that's in 100 bucks into like 10,000 or whatever in a couple weeks, that doesn't tell you about thousands or tens of thousands or more people that are getting burned buying it when it's just dramatically inflated in value, just completely unreasonably. Um, 
And it's just important to keep in mind that where there's that volatility, there's more of that fear of missing out. And that is just a general uh, part of the nature of high risk assets. So if you're like me and you're risk seeking, 120 is pretty good for you. If you're a little more risk moderate, 110. If you're, if you're pretty uh, risk averse, then uh, the rule 100 is good. So the rule is essentially you take your age. So if you're like 30, say the person's 30, they're very risk seeking and they could handle the fumble and the volatility, they could sleep well, having risky assets, and they would subtract their age from 120, that'd be 90. That would mean that 90% of their portfolio should be in equities, which is essentially stocks and ETFs or mutual funds. So you should just kind of have 90% of your holdings should be in here. The 10% could be in like bonds or cash. Um, and I'd say excluding your uh, emergency fund so we're talking about post-emergency funds. So once you have that set up, then you can start applying these rules. If you're moderate, uh, a moderate at risk uh, tolerance, you could do rule 110. So if you were 30, I mean, 80% of your portfolio would be in these kinds of assets. And if you're pretty risk averse, you're 30, maybe 70%. Um, Benjamin Graham in his book, The Intelligent Investor, he also talks about a general rule of never really going about, ever having a ratio um, that's, or disproportionate than 75 to 25. You'd never have more than 75% of your portfolio in low risk stuff like bonds. You would never have more than 75% of your portfolio in risky stuff like individual stocks. And he was he wrote that about 80 years ago. Theories have come up. It's a good one. It's a good way to stay safe and it's simple. People that don't want to have um, complex approaches um, that take a lot of time and effort. Um, and he talks about that a lot in his book. So, uh, that's, I, I think it's interesting. I don't personally apply that part, but it is a good way for people to have a very simple approach, but I think these rules are a little bit there, especially if you're young. Um, and last, there's this rule of 72, as far as thinking about, uh, how, how is your money going to grow? How are your investments going to grow? Again, if you're going for like the mutual funds, and the passive stuff we're talking about today with dollar cost averaging, you can expect that eight to 12% return um, annually, which means over long periods of time, if you're, if you're getting that say 10% return from these things, um, what you do is you would divide 72 by 10 and I'll give you the years to double it. So that's 7.2 years. Um, so if you put hundred dollars in, you get that annual growth at 10%, in a half years, it'll be 200. Um, and again, we'll look a little bit more at the math on that in a graph later. Uh, so I I used Charles Schwab. That was one of the, I kind of set that up at the same time as Robinhood. I just ended up using Robinhood because I thought the UI was better. And also, when I set it up, uh, it wasn't charging any uh, fees, any trading fees uh, for transacting. Schwab was at the time. Pretty much the entire industry has emulated Robinhood at this point, and you don't have to pay fees for any transactions. And, you know, traditional. Uh, stock exchanges at the time they weren't. So that's why I ended up using Robinhood more. Now, when it comes to looking at exchange or ETFs or exchange traded products, we had a really cool research tool. So you can just, you log in, you'd see this in the bar, uh, hit research, go over, click on this, It'll take you here. Um, again, depending kind of on your risk profile, I, I just kind of made these two bars to get an idea of what different risks are in this. Um, you can kind of see it also on the returns, because uh, again, when you have a higher risk stock, it's going to be more volatile, um, which can be more stressful, but also over time, you'll get that higher return. So the higher, highest risk thing would be a small cap. So this is a small value cap, small blend cap, growth cap, and then growth. And essentially the difference between value and growth is when you have a growth approach to investing, you're looking at uh, a firm or you could do an ETF of firms at based on their financials, based on their position in the industry are going to outcompete their competitors in uh, online in growing working capital, improving profit margin, capturing market share. Uh, they're going to, they're, they're just going to outcompete them. 
And that's a little more difficult to actually determine, which is why it's higher risk um, versus value. And value is you have a firm, um, generally going to be more established, you know, your apples, your, your blue chips. Um, and for some reason, maybe there was a scandal. Um, maybe there was uh, an institutional investor or a group of institutional investors decided to pivot uh, their portfolio allocations. For some reason, the value of the stock has dropped below kind of the intrinsic value. Um, and that's a little safer to determine because that's just kind of driven more by historical factors. Looking back at the actual performance of the firm over the last maybe five, seven, ten years, um, whereas growth is more focused on projecting into the future and the future is uncertain, which is why it's more risky. So value is just a, a, a stock is simply undervalued right now. Uh, the firm is worth more um, than it's currently listed. Uh, so you grab it and then you get that, you get those returns. And then also, uh, usually these guys are going to pay dividends, whereas growth are going to be more focused on reinvesting in the firm. So it's not really going to be a source of passive income so much. It's a source of capital gains. And a blend is just both together. Oh, so you can see here, I know this is, looks like a lot, but look on the bottom right at the Morningstar style box. You can see this is a large blend, which means it's low moderate risk, maybe about 40% of the way up that bar that I showed earlier. Um, and Morningstar, they're, they're fine. They're, I mean, it, they're kind of the only objective source of evaluating a security. Uh, there's just not really anybody else out there. Um, so take it with a grain of salt because they're the only one, but they're, they're okay. They're pretty good at it. Um, so all rating of the Vanguard total stock market index ETF, up, you know, four stars performing well over the last uh, few years. Um, and up there a little riskier. So you get a little bit of a higher return because this is just the American stock market. You can strategy. It tells you it's just a stock market, uh, top thousand, say top thousand, I changed that. Um, but one of the keys here, and this goes back to that story with Buffett on um, why, uh, when you're just doing passive investing, uh, why ETFs are so attractive compared to mutual funds is these expense ratios. So it's pretty common for a mutual fund to charge maybe 0 0.5 or even 1% or 2%. These ETFs, they charge 0.03%, maybe 0.08 or something like that. Um, so they're just dramatically less expensive to maintain um, as far as uh, paying the managers. But another issue is a mutual fund, legally, you own a piece of every single firm that the mutual fund is holding for you. It's the same thing with an ETF. Um, but ETF generally is just going to be indexing, which means you know, if a company hits this parameter, then it's automatically going to automatically buy it and include it in the ETF, or we're going to automatically sell it out, which is why something like you know, the SPY ETF, which is just the S&P 500, or the, v the VTI, which is like, I think the top thousand largest market cap firms uh, on the American Stock Exchange. It's, it's just technical. It's, are you in the S&P 500? Are you in the top thousand market cap firms? Or are you not? Um, and that doesn't change a lot. There's not many buys and sells. because every, And every time there's a sell, that's a taxable event. When you own a share in that ETF, and they say somebody falls out of the S&P 500, so they sell, uh, they sell, position that firm, and they buy the company that replaced them, that's now a taxable event. You're going to have taxes in the next tax year. Mutual fund has a lot more transactions, generally, because they're actively managed, whereas an ETF is passively managed. That passive management is what really makes these expense ratios so low. But a hidden cost is the active management of those mutual funds, your tax burden increases along with you paying a higher expense ratio of maybe as high as 2%. Um, so that, that cost uh, isn't really represented anywhere exactly. Um, that's more of just a knowledge thing in terms of how these uh, different instrument, financial instruments function. Um, it's, it's, it's important to take into consideration because it does compound over time and, and eats into your long-term gains. And, you know, you can see more technical detail and stuff here. Uh, but this is just, this is, again, this is Charles Schwab. This is why I like them is because they have all this research that you can look at on an individual ETF. 
and there's more if you like went online and looked at it. Uh, so again, the VTI, this is really just, it's essentially the American stock market. That's what it's indexing. Um, so, so I bought that and then you have the VXUS, which is essentially, it says it right here. Um, yeah. Investment seeks to track the performance of a benchmark index that measures the investment return of stocks issued by companies located and developed in emerging markets, excluding the United States. That's every stock market except the United States. We've got state stock market and every other stock market. So the way I see uh, I'm both of these consistently and holding them for long periods of time is I'm just kind of betting that that humanity will grow. Um, it's not like anywhere near like the majority of my portfolio but i think it's a good hedge in case i ever make big mistakes in my active investing strategy and again you got the morning star stuff here it's the same as eti it's a it's a large cap blend um and 0 0.08 which is still uh, pretty cheap uh as far as uh expenses go so that maybe you maybe you want to do those kinds of ETFs that I'm doing. There's also the SPY or like, you know, I do CXSE, which is the Chinese technology sector ETF. Um, and maybe you care about commodities or energy or whatever, whatever you're picking. And you can even do it with individual stocks. I do it with individual stocks, especially when there's a, you know, a, a market correction or a, or a bear market um, occurring. I always do dollar cost averaging through them. Basically what it does, if you look on the right, want to buy in security is underpriced when it's overpriced when it's correctly priced and you do that monthly weekly quarterly um and the idea is that as you pay when it's over and underpriced you're about going to get the average price so if you're getting the average price let's say that you're investing in the s p 500 etf all the s p 500 over long periods of time is going to return eight to twelve percent annually you're going to get the average price and the average price. You're going to get that average return. You're going to get that average eight to 12% annual return. That's the strategy. It's literally that simple. You're just getting the average price, getting the average return, and you're not trying to do any, anything special or, or impressive or, or anything like that. It's really simple, straightforward. Um, and I think every human should have that in their portfolio. Um, whether that should be the only thing you have, or that should be maybe half or a minority or whatever it is that you're doing, that's kind of more up to how much work are you willing to put in and, and what, what's your um, tolerance like? Um, I think every human should be cost averaging these, um, some kind of ETF uh, or I don't know, maybe you can find a great mutual fund or, or, or whatever else. Um, but it's just a great way to protect yourself from like, maybe you lump some everything in right before the 2008 uh, recession hits. If you threw all your money in, like right at the peak, right before that crashed, you're kind of stealing years of gains from yourself. But if you dollar cost average through it, then you're going to be you're going to be buying assets while they're at those all time lows uh, during the recession, even though you're buying them at all time highs right before it. And that's just a it's just a simple way to protect yourself and to not be too stressed out when you see a crash, because um, you're just like, okay, good, this will this will help. This will, I'll be getting everything for a little cheaper than usual, and I don't care anyway because. I'm investing. I'm not trading. I'm, I'm holding these things for years. Um, I, I don't know if I talked about that, but um, trading is just when you buy uh, an asset with the intention of selling it within one year, which means you're paying the short-term capital gains, which are more than twice as much as long-term capital gains. This is investing is buying with the intention of holding it for at least a year. I'd say more like five or seven or 10 or, or more years. Uh, everything I buy, I buy with the intention of holding it for like at least 20 years. Um, obviously, circumstances change, executive management changes, uh, trees uh, have shifts um, and shocks and everything. Um, so you got to be prepared to adjust for that. Uh, Michael, this, this is a this is a investing thing. Yeah, I had a question uh, for the cost dollar cost averaging. What would your recommendations be for how much you allocate for the trade? Well, again, that's going to kind of come down to your uh, uh, risk tolerance. So for me, like I said, I'm very, I'm a very risk seeking person. I do a lot of active investing. Um, I think about, I think over, I think over 80, 
95%, might even be 90% of my portfolio is from active investing, which is not, which almost none of it comes from dollar cost averaging. Um, I think the best, I think the best place to start is just dollar cost average, um, some ETFs, uh, get, get some exposure, kind of get you, cause you're going to see as the market kind of is volatile and is changing, um, you're going to get stressed out when you start to see that you're down 10% or 20% or whatever. Um, you're going to get elated. That's kind of what this graph on the left is about. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, more, awesome. more, more focused question then in regards to like, let's say the first month, would you recommend just if, if I was to get my paycheck, would I put all 90% of my paycheck in the first month in that, in that first initial trade, or would I allocate maybe 10% or 20% or what do you think? I think you should make sure you got that six month cash reserve, right? Make sure you got all the credit card paid off, right? So something right. that's all done. Then um, I, I mean, I would just pick an amount that you think you can commit to spending every single month for the next like two years, but maybe you work in a seasonal industry or um, maybe you're in sales and, and sometimes you get a big payday kind of thing, um, which kind of determines your, your lifestyle. You can commit to no matter what my employment is, no matter what my um, commission checks are like or are not like, I can commit absolutely to 100 a month, 200 a month, 300 a month, 500 a month. For me, I do minimum 400 a month because I've built up cash to always be able to put that in as part of my strategy. Um, so I think like, you know, I think a lot of people should be able to do, you know, at least like 50 or 100 a month. But depending on how much cash you have saved and how stable your sources of income are just pick an amount just determine an amount that you can budget you can be like no matter what i am spending 300 a month 500 a month on my dollar cost averaging um if you're going paycheck to paycheck that gets a little more difficult i you know i'd say you know you probably want to build up a little more cash you get in at one of the lower numbers build up that cash reserve so that you're not depending on your income to be investing so that if you lose your job you've got that cap you've got the cash an emergency fund sitting on the side to support yourself. And then you've got the cash sitting in your portfolio or your brokerage account, keep investing uh, into these ETFs passively because okay. you don't want to be dependent on your income. If you lose your job and then the market has a whole, like a terrible, like a big crash, like it did last April, you want to have cash in reserve to keep buying in while that's happening. Uh, so I, let's, yeah, ju let's just assume it's like $500 a month. Would you go in, in the first day of the month and go into the trade or are you, that's, are you yeah, that's, at... not, that's, arbit that's arbitrary. You can just, I mean, I, I do the 15th, uh, okay. middle of the month, but you can do the first, the 10th, 31st. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, yeah, I think everybody should do like at least, you know, 50 or hundred a month. Um, hopefully, you know, but everybody has different circumstances. Maybe you have debt. Um, maybe you're underemployed. Uh, who knows? And, and it's better to do dollar cost averaging. Let's say, let's say I get $10,000 from someone, right? Would it be better just to split that 10,000, you know, a thousand every month that way. And then just dollar cost average in over the next 12 months, or would you recommend just going in with that 10,000, uh, the first month? Yeah. So whenever you get a lump sum from like inheritance or big commission check or, or selling a house or whatever. And yeah, I would never lump sum it like that. Um, it would be rare that I think that'd be appropriate. You'd have to have a lot of knowledge and a lot of research done on a specific opportunity. As far as passive investing ETFs, no, that you would never lump sum a big payday like that. Uh, because again, what happens if tomorrow, you know, there's another 9-11 and the whole economy shuts down and the stock market crashes? Uh, you want to avoid um, getting hurt by something like that. Uh, and even like... I. Even if you, if you got like a big payday, you know, if you got like a big inheritance check or something and now you're sitting like sitting there with like 50K or 10K or 5K or whatever, um, I wouldn't really even necessarily put it in over 12 months. It might be better to think about putting it in over 24 months or 36 months. Um, and again, uh, that's going to be really particular to what your sources of income are like, how stable sources of income are, how much cash you already have on the sidelines that you're just waiting for an opportunity to jump into. Um, which is one of the big things I learned to do is to try to always keep a significant amount of cash on hand specifically for investing in market um, dramatic decreases or corrections or anything. 
Um, so we don't want to go all in on on how it's shown on the left side where the euphoria is, right? We don't want to put that 10,000 at that peak. We want to kind of cost average in in the optimism um, where we have it, where it's averaging out in the optimism level, right? Yeah, that's that's the general strategy. That's kind of like, yeah, that, that, that's definitely the general strategy. Um, and you can even you can even perform a little better um, than what that optimism is. I mean, because like what I did when um, COVID hit last year is I had a bunch of cash on the sidelines and during like March and April when things were like really bad, but things were bad for a couple months later. So for maybe, maybe for about like six weeks or so, eight weeks, um, I basically doubled the amount that I was dollar cost averaging. So instead of doing my usual 400 minimum for those, I was doing 800. So what I was doing, instead of doing um, 400 every four weeks, I was doing 400 every two weeks um, and ended up buying just, just getting a much lower average cost on uh, on my passive investments. Um, so you can you can you know you don't have to be like super strict about it, but I think um, just trying to hit that optimism line where the price is going to be there. That's that's the the easiest and simplest way. And then as you get as you gain experience, as you watch markets, as you read literature, as you go to networking events and and study and um, get mentors and whatever can start to maybe tweak your approach a bit to, to improve your outcomes. Um, and if you don't, if you don't want to learn about that, then just do the, just do the simple consistent identical amount every month. Maybe you get like a salary bump. And so you can increase what your monthly is. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it should be easy to hit that, hit that. Uh, and, you know, having that emotional control, that's part of the, the breakout thing we're going to have because in that fear of missing out, um, you know, you see Tesla skyrocketing or whatever, and, and you just get scared, or you see um, GameStop skyrocketing, and you, and you just buy in when it's way overpriced, and you're not doing fundamental research on it, and uh, you're, just, you're frankly not that experienced, um, and it's a good way to get burned. I did it plenty of times, you know, the first three, six months or whatever that I was investing, um, So and, and we'll dive deeper into those. So, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, Help I and then, uh, Michael, another quick question: Do you do you ever compare your results with with uh, the S and P five hundred? And if you're if you're matching it, if you're beating it, if you're underperforming, I started to do that. I mean, I think I've been beating it by like, I think from the time that I started, I'm like triple the S and P five hundred. Um, but I also discount my personal performance by a lot because it's only been two and a half years. Um. I always recommend people do this dollar cost averaging passive investing is to kind of just get whatever the market's returning because uh -huh. it might, it might turn out that four years goes by and I made some big mistakes and I, I, I just have a massive crash in my portfolio and I need to um, acknowledge that uh, sometimes you can't beat the market. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, I work really hard to hopefully um, continue getting uh, good returns um, that are at or above uh, the market. Um, personally, I, I really want to get to seven years of investing. So I want to get another four and a half years under my belt before I can kind of very confidently say that um, at least with small amounts of money, so anything kind of under a, like a, a few million dollars that I can actually take that and and um, and, and get the kinds of returns I've been realizing so far. Um, so I just need more time. Um, yeah. yeah so in just, reality, I've been beating it. Just to give you guys some context, um, with investing with the S&P 500, you're going to be looking at your trades and comparing it with the S&P to see if you match or beat the S&P. And the, the strategy in it is, are you dollar cost averaging yourself and making a certain amount of percentage that's beating the S&P? Or is it just better to invest every month in the S&P 500 and, and be assured that whatever that 14%, 15%, I think the S&P last year did like 16% or something like that. Um, so it's a typical benchmark in investing world that people compare their returns with the S&P 500. Yeah, no, the S&P 500 is generally um, considered to be the American stock market, um, just like the, the representation. So, you know, there's the SPY. Um, the SPY is 
the spy ETF you can buy in and you're just and the S P five hundred. Um you can just dollar cost average that. You'll if you just do the regular dollar cost averaging, you'll pro you might underperform a little bit because you know you're paying those expenses. But I mean it's just it's just it's a it's very slight. Um yeah, no. Whenever you have the question of how am I performing, yeah, just look at what it how, what did you do over this period of time versus what the S P five hundred do. It's, yeah, that's exactly right. Um so as far as getting to a million with passive investing, um if you were doing hundred a month. 35 years um, at a 9% return. And we said, you know, we said 8 to 12%. That's kind of where the average is. So 9% is a little on the low end. Um, so if you got that 9% return for 35 years, uh, you're going to get to uh, a million, just over a million dollars. If you started when you're 30, you hit 65, you'll have a million sitting there for you. Um, assuming you're not doing like 401k and other stuff, uh, which gives higher returns because you get those, those matches and everything. Um, then if you kind of got, maybe if you got on the high end, maybe you got lucky, um, then it'd be about double that over 35 years. Um, so it's really a simple way to become a millionaire um, by retirement. Um, if you're starting late, uh, you know, if you started you're 20, then you'd have this years before that. Um, uh, yeah, this, so again, like I said, I do 400 a month minimum. And that's just kind of, this is just kind of my hedge for in case I end up making a bunch of mistakes. Then at least I've got this kind of standard growth. Um, and Michael, that's that's 4,800 um, initial investment. Is that while you're putting more money in every month or is that just the initial and that's that's all it is? Yeah, so that's just in the first year. At the end of the first year, you would have 4,800. Actually, when I calculated this, I said 4,800 with no monthly interest growth so let's just say you get to the end of year one and you're at 4800 then every year you put in another 4800 over 12 months and and you and each year after that first year you're going to get that nine percent of that 12 percent growth i see and your you're, and your five will be here eight eleven I, I know it's like in three year increments i think um so i a lot of passive investing stuff um Shopify has been the best return in my portfolio. I think it's up like, I don't know, like 130 percent, something like that. Now might be a little different. Um, it's pretty volatile because it's a it's risky. Um, this is kind of how I would. I think Sam mentioned this kind of at the beginning. You have an epiphany, see something cool in the news, or you're going through your daily life and you notice that there's. Um, maybe some company's brand is everywhere or whatever it is. You, you have like an epiphany. And you're like, wow, you know what? That actually is really interesting. I wonder how that company is performing um, if they're a worthy investment. Um, you'd have your qual qualitative validation is what I call it, where you'd like go and you'd like read the Wall Street Journal. You'd like go like Google and go to like the news tab of Google and you know, maybe like ask around at, like at your friends and just kind of look for any reason to doubt the success of a company. You can't find that, or even better, if you can find more reasons to think it'll be successful, then you'd go to this final step right here, which is um, looking at some key ratios on the financial statements. Um, so, first one I tell people to look at is the quick ratio, the quick asset test ratio. Um, basically, what this is, if the number is a, is a 1.0, that means that the company has of like cash and cash equivalents cover the next 12 months of debt that they have to pay. This tells you they won't they won't have to like declare bankruptcy or default on any debt in the next 12 months. Personally, I prefer that to usually maybe be up three. What I like maybe like 1.5 to three somewhere in there is what I usually like to see. I mean, these shop value was insane. Um, and something interesting. I don't know how they did this. Um, I mean, I could guess, but it, obviously they've got like. A lot of cash on hand or cash equivalents. You know, like here, basically we have over 15 years of cash to pay off all their debt. Um, if you go down here to cash ROA, I went from 10.8 quick ratio to 15.4, went down 7 to 0.4. And you think, well, yeah, I mean, they're putting more cash on the sidelines. They're not, they're not investing that cash to get a return on it. It's just kind of sitting there. Um, it's not invested. Then strangely, and, you know, they go 15.4 down to 8.7. So cash ROA goes up, um, you know, like quintuples. And then this, 
I don't even know what to think, honestly. Um, I'd like to go talk to people that know more about investing than me. They basically almost double the quick ratio, putting cash on the sidelines. And the cash ROA almost triple. Like, I mean, it goes up by two and a half, or two and a half times. Um, 2.25 times. I don't know how they did that. I mean, I could like, I mean, I, I know like I went back and like I kind of read more deeply in their financial statements and all the cool stuff they're doing. And like their, their working capital has been growing like crazy. You can see down here, 165 million, six and a half billion in six years. That's insane. Um, and you can just see how, how it was like basically exponential. Um, uh, well, again, this is the best, this was the success I've had in choosing an individual um, uh, security. Um, and, you know, when I, when I first saw them, it was in 2019. So I, I didn't have, I actually didn't have the 2020 to 2019 financial statements. I only had 15 through 18. Looking at 15 through 18, when I, when I first bought in, you know, they're not profitable, but they're getting better. Um, but also it's the nature of tech companies now, a lot of companies now to not be profitable in the growth stage. So I wasn't too concerned. Again, they have that really fast, good growth in working capital. Um, then uh, that quick ratio, they, they had plenty of cash uh, to pay off their debts. So I wasn't worried about them defaulting. Um, and so seeing all that, and really the, the first reason I got interested in these guys was because I, I read an article that talked about the government of Ontario giving Shopify permission to sell uh, cannabis online in Canada. Um, and I was like, well, uh, people love cannabis. So getting access to sell that online is just going to boom your business. Um, and I think that's happened. They've also had, uh, they had a lot of success in 2020, obviously, because of COVID. Everybody went to e-commerce, you know, the, the virtual marketplace and everything, um, which definitely was totally, I never would have guessed. It just happened to help them out, which is good for me. Um, regardless, they were already doing well before that. Uh, so this, this is an example of kind of the active stuff. Um, we'll do more of this at the next meeting. I'm going to kind of like, I think I'm going to take like maybe three uh, sheets that look like this, different companies. People can sit down together and kind of compare. It's like, oh, they have a really bad quick ratio, but they have a really good profit margin. Or, you know, their working capital is not growing fast enough. Yeah, but they have a really good cash ROA. So, and like, so people can kind of debate and, and get more familiar with the terminology and everything. Um, but I always do, I always create this kind of, assessment from financial statements before actually investing um that's the end if you want more information sapedia.com any questions you have about anything with financial literacy investing stocks companies whatever just go to investopedia.com like they have really good uh quick uh, short articles on everything um you go to michaelfarrellportfolio.squarespace.com um you can see a little bit more about me um and uh, some of the guys that I reference as far as like what I've learned from them. Um, I need to learn more from Peter Lynch. Um, Jack Bogle or John Bogle, John quote Jack Bogle. Uh, he's the person that created ETFs because he thought that mutual funds are too expensive. Um, so he's kind of a savior in that sense. Um, Benjamin Graham, obviously his book is really what gave me the ability to like create stuff like this um, and to do so and to be more confident in uh, looking at individual stocks. Um, and then just understanding mindsets and the history and everything. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Jack Bogle, uh, he has a really, he's a really good following, a lot of good literature on how to be a passive investor. Um, and, uh, but Benjamin Graham talks about it too. So you can go to any of this stuff, uh, for more information. Um, yeah, besides that. Yeah. Thanks guys. That was great. Yeah. Now I'll put, uh, I'll put Benjamin Graham's book here. Um, so that people can look that up as well in the event chat. An intelligent investor. That's the one, right? It's a very technical book. It's very dry. Um, but I mean, the knowledge is incredible. Awesome. Any questions for Michael? Uh, yeah, I got one. Uh, Michael, have you dived into, uh, options? Yeah, I, um, I've never really had more than maybe 3% of my Robinhood portfolio in options. 
I got burned on them. Um, the first one I ever bought, I bought um, like a canvas option. Um, it was to like purchase, I think like 18 months later or something. I blew like 600 bucks on that, lost all of it. Um, but I've also had um, good experiences where like for some reason, maybe like a year ago, Fitbit stock just crashed and I couldn't find like a good reason for why um, from everything I was reading. But um, yeah, I mean like it just, it crashed like 70% or something. So I wasn't sure what to think and I didn't want to get super exposed to them in case maybe I was just missing something. So I bought an option for like maybe like, I bought like three or four options for like $100. Ended up I think getting like an 80% return on all those um, like a year later. Um, but they're just, the more experience I get, the more comfortable I get with them. Um, those are all call options. Um, I tried to do put options on a GameStop, but I mean, I had to put like 20,000 cash down or something to get the put options when obviously it was super overpriced, but I was like, um, I don't trust, I don't trust Wall Street bets to become reasonable enough to risk that kind of cash. Um, and then uh, those other options, um, I I would generally avoid it if you're going to do them and you're just kind of starting. I wouldn't really put down more than maybe like one or $200 on it just because um, they're, they're a little funky. Um, and I also don't really do options unless it's like at least one year of time before I can exercise it. Um, there's no, like I said, normally I'm basically doing a value investment with an option. I'm finding a stock like Ford. I did this with Ford um, where it's undervalued for some reason. I just buy the option, and then I plan that the market's going to correct for that, uh, and, and I can exercise it in the future. Essentially, options are high risk, high reward, um, and they're pretty much when you buy an option, they're they're essentially you're you're buying the ability to buy that stock, but not the obligation to it. So if it does go up in value and you've bought that option, you can then exercise it and buy it for a lower price. Um, or if it goes down, you don't necessarily have to buy the stock upright. You could just you can just take the cost of the premium that you paid for um, that way. But it's it's uh, the reason why I bring up options is because it's a tool that can be used when you do cost dollar averaging. Um, you can sell premium, which will reduce your your cost average down. If let's say you have a hundred stock and you think that it's gonna, you know, um, not really go up in value, you could sell call options for that for premium, which will essentially reduce your stock price in a sense. Just something to think about. Wow, it's getting that's getting a lot more complicated than I think this <laughs> this meeting was intended for, but. Yeah, that. I mean, I yeah, they're, they're because, powerful fools. Yeah, I bring it up because it's it's something that a lot of traders do. So just under, you don't have to understand the mechanics of it, but just understand that that's something that's happening mm -hmm. with stocks in general when people trade them. And right. that's like like I said, I don't I don't really trade anything, including options. If I'm using an option, I'm using it as an investment tool because I see it as I want to. I think that and I think a stock will be more valuable in one or two years. So I'll buy an option to buy it in one or two years. Um, whereas if you're trading, you're probably going to do it more in the weeks or months um, or even days uh, kind of approach. Mm. Um, and they're cool, and we could definitely talk more about options. That's definitely more of like a, an active thing. Um, did anybody, did, were there any questions in terms of the uh, any of the passive stuff that I went through? I, I have a, a general question. For you, um, what what are your thoughts, at least over the last year, kind of the disconnect between the stock market and the real economy? Oh boy! I mean, the stock market is not the economy. An economy is much more complex. An economy is only grow at maybe one, two, three percent annually. A stock market, the American stock market, grows at eight to twelve percent. So they're different. They're different animals. Um, and uh, well. Everything I've been studying um, over the last year, when you have this just massive stimulus approach from a government, um, people people have seen it before. They start to get worried about you know their cat their purchasing power decreasing, um, and really the traditional way. Um, you know, we, I think we saw this happen 
have been the early 70s. Um, people are afraid that, that purchase power is going to go down because of inflation. So they put a bunch of money in the stock market. There's a huge rally in the stock market, lots of gains. Um, and then that tapers off and stagnates or maybe even uh, decreases in the future. Um, I don't know if that really is what's happening because this was not a traditional recession uh, because essentially um, we don't need analytics or we, we don't need economists to come in and tell us why uh, you know growth slowed down. Everybody knows exactly what happened. It was COVID. Everyone knows um, versus you know the complexities of uh, bad loans and mortgages or um, issue with contracting monetary supply back in the Great Depression and also massively um, inflated prices for farmers' products by the, the federal government and stuff back in, in the Great Recession. Uh, it's just not a it's just not a complex issue. Everybody kind of knows what happens, and um, so. Uh, there was already a trend of um, companies having smaller footprints in terms of uh, leases for real estate um, because the two most expensive line items on much any firm's uh, balance sheet is labor and wait so wages and then uh, rent. And I, mean, I think economically, the good thing that we, I think it, it's a silver lining at least that part of the last year has been becoming so much more socially acceptable, um, but also um, kind of learning by doing how to have the virtual uh, collaborative economy. Um, you know, I'm not excited about all the money that the feds are going to be put into the economy. Um, but uh, I don't think this will, I, it's, it's, it's different and hopefully less harmful than past recessions. And then and the stock market, like I said, that's kind of a store of value for people. Um, and there are a lot of good firms out there. Um, so uh, I wouldn't lose faith in it yet. Not in the long run. You know, like I said, I'm an investor. I'm not really concerned if we have a bad year or two or three in a row. Um, and about, I think, I believe it's about 70, around 70% of, for the last like 100, 100 years or so, about 70% of years, the stock market grows. Um, and like I said, it's different from the economy. Um, because the economy is comprised of a lot of private firms, whereas the stock market is exclusively public firms. Um, and the economy is primarily primary firms, private firms. So uh, I wouldn't lose faith in the American stock market yet. Uh, empirically, it's been the best performing one for a while. Although, like I said, um, Chinese bond market is just eviscerating us. Um, China has all their own problems too, especially in real estate. So, uh, that's why it's important to kind of like, you know, learn about stocks, learn about real estate, learn about, um, building, uh, sources of income. Uh, I personally want to learn more about corporate bonds. Um, I think those are interesting. I think those might be a good alternative to government bonds. Um, and, uh, I mean, especially, I don't know. Old, I mean, I'm guessing that the average age here is probably maybe 30, um, so I think this is still a good time to be getting exposed to the stock market in a way that your risk tolerance can, can bear. Yeah, I, I guess, I, I mean, I don't know if people have to go, but I was, I, was, I was more thinking like as you as an investor, how do you tether in the security prices of stocks with economic fundamentals? Because at least a lot of my worldview is there's over sort of the highest rate of zombie corporations that ever exist, which means any hike in interest rate they wouldn't even be able to pay their interest yet alone principal on their debt uh and then on top of that um you know there's not really any fundamental barometer and even if you use the buffett indicator it shows like seismic overvaluation across the entire market so i guess i'm just curious how you're navigating that or how you perceive that i don't i don't invest in a firm without reading their financial statements. Um, and kind of one of the first, one of the first uh, answers I have is what's the PE ratio? A lot of firms right now that have just freakishly high PE ratios and that's kind of unprecedented and I don't know why it's happening. It's been happening for a long time, especially in tech. Um, so I want to see 
a company that preferably has a PE ratio under 25. Um, the teens would be better. Um, and like I said, the first thing I tell people is that there's a lot of bad companies out there with like can't handle their debt. Um, so look at the quick ratio. It's not too difficult to calculate. Um, and it tells you a lot. And to kind of tie that into the more fundamental economics, um, and, you know, I think uh, in, in an investing chat I run, you know, you want to look at the government, uh, how they're getting involved. Like I said, with Shopify, they were giving permission to sell cannabis. Um, the Trump administration was putting tariffs on hardware for Canadian solar technology. Biden administration said they're going to decrease that. Um, so I told people, hey, I think Canadian Solar Incorporated is a cool company. Um, they have a P their PE ratio was like maybe 14. Um, quick ratio was like maybe 0.9, so not great, but they're profitable. Um, so it's a little more risky, but you know, I think that given that the government is going to be interested, the, the democratic government is gonna be interested in promoting uh, solar, the solar industry, um, I think this is a good opportunity for the amount of risk that I'm willing to handle um, and as far as like a lot of technical stuff, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, you have like alpha and beta and gamma and omega, and, you know, I know there's like Reddit groups for all those things. I don't, I've found that just what's been working for me and I'm trying to get more sophisticated as I can. I'm trying to come up with a, a few different ways to calculate the intrinsic value or, or price of a stock. I'm trying to figure out how I want to use that just different tools. I think it's really important not to be too technical. I think it's important to read the financial statements, you know, which is why I've got the ratios that I like to focus on. Um, and if you feel comfortable focusing on those ratios and others, or a mix of both, or maybe even less, um, and yeah, you know, go experiment with it. But uh, we're dealing with humans, and humans are very fickle um, and also corrupt, you know, so the numbers are not always most important thing. Um, I think it's important to focus on some of the qualitative sides of things. Um, like for example, I got into Starbucks because I can look at their, their basic uh, finances. Then also they've had, I think they've like, I think they went from maybe, I want to say it was like, set, I have this written in a document. I think it was like 1700, like over 3000 brick and mortars over like two years in mainland China. And I also have a lot of personal relationships with some Chinese citizens. And the number one competitor with Starbucks in China was Luckin Coffee. And they had a massive scandal. The CFO embezzled like over, like I think it was like a quarter of a billion dollars from the company um, and just wrecked the company. I think their, their market cap shrank by like 70 or 80%. Um, and the only thing that's really holding up now is the government. The government decided to come in, decided to kind of bail them out a little bit so that there would be a Chinese competitor in coffee. Um, so it's important to look at those technical um, indicators. Uh, I, I know a lot of people are talking about was it the, the two and 10 year, two and 10 year yield treasury spread and the implications of that. Um, and honestly, I mean, you can go down so many rabbit holes of technical analysis. Um, the way I was trained in economics is to focus more on the qualitative side of things, um, to look more at the human element, um, and then to um, kind of validate that with the technical approach. Um, so I, I, I think you, you just got to marry the two as best you can. Uh, and um, I mean, so... I'm always down to learn about more and to try to integrate them into my overall analysis, but you can very quickly just, just overload yourself with technical information. I mean, humans are very limited. Like we cannot process, that's why central planning doesn't work. You just can't, there's just too much information to process. You've got to, you got to choose some filters and just run with them. Um, and like I said, I'm waiting to kind of hit that seven year mark before I really trust my approach. Hmm. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Well, thanks for sharing, Michael. If there's no more questions, uh, we will wrap up here.
If you guys have anything else, feel free to drop it in the chat, and I put a little bit of information there for you guys. If you're new here, make sure you fill out that welcome survey. Just a short intro survey so we can get to know you a little bit better, and you'll get warp speed if you do that. And if you want to sign up for Michael's next event on active investing, the link is in there as well for the Eventbrite. You can check out all our Eventbrite, all our upcoming events on Eventbrite at that link, or you can go to the Google Calendar and see them. So that is all for today. We have a another event on Wednesday on existential intelligence and how it can apply to your business and help your business grow. So be sure to check that one out as well. Michael, thank you so much for coming in and uh, talking today. We really appreciate your time and sharing all this information you've picked up. I'm sure it's been uh, instrumental in these to these guys as well. Thanks for the attention. Thanks for hosting, Sam. Yeah. All right, guys. Take care. Bye.